Thank you, uh, Nancy, for welcoming everyone. And let me uh, add my voice to yours in, in welcoming everyone uh, who's traveled here today uh, for what I think are going to be a couple of great days of science. Um, can we can we get this? Okay, so um, my talk uh, is uh, titled GP Wright, What It Is, Where We've Been, and Where We're Going. And so let's dive right into that. What is GP Wright? Um, I'm going to start simple because we have, uh, we have a diverse crowd here. We have some scientists that want to know, you know, uh, about individual DNA sequences. And we have some reporters that might not want that kind of fine-grained uh, discussion. So start very big picture. Uh, it is a project, as you just heard from Nancy, to support technology development in genome writing. Also uh, can be described as genome design synthesis. And then evaluation of the biologic impact of genome design changes. Uh, this is uh, this quote here is uh, paraphrasing uh, what we've written in our white paper as uh, probably our, our number one aim, which is to reduce the cost of designing, synthesizing, assembling, and testing genomes uh, in cells by a thousandfold over the next 10 years. Uh, it's a it's an aggressive goal, uh, but we think, based on what we saw with the uh, uh, Human Genome Project, the, the reading project, if you will, uh, we think we can do this. Uh, and we think that such technology improvements will really revolutionize how we as scientists learn about the world and then how we use that information to engineer it. So Nancy alluded to the development of a roadmap for GP Wright. Um, and uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, uh, GP Wright versus GP Read. So GP Read is what we have called, what we now refer to the Human Genome Project, the sequencing project uh, of the human genome, which which was, uh, of course, expanded to include many model organism genomes, like the yeast, the fruit fly, the mouse, et cetera. Um, <coughs> and so uh, GP Wright uh, is the next phase. And it's interesting to contemplate the difference between reading and writing. Uh, you kind of know when you're done when you're reading. Um, because you finished the book, you, you've read all of it. Um, there might be some interpretation, some complexities of interpretation, but reading is, is very well suited to a purely scientific endeavor because it's very clear when you, when you finish decoding a document. On the other hand, writing is, it, it has a sort of element of creativity to it. It's, it, it has an artistic side, if you will. And you never know when you're finished because you could write one book or you could write a thousand books. So there's something fundamentally different about it that um, excites me and others. Now, what about GP Wright versus HGP Wright? One year ago, uh, the predecessor of this meeting was titled HGP Wright. Well, as you'll, as you'll see in a moment, uh, we, we have um, defined GP right as the overarching effort to develop technology to write genomes. That's really what we're all about. And of course, we're all passionately interested in our own genome. And the notion that we could actually write a human genome is simultaneously thrilling to some and not so thrilling to others. And so we recognize that this is going to take a lot of discussion from a lot of stakeholders. And so we've defined HGP right as an initiative within <coughs> GP right um, that perhaps we will need to move a little bit more slowly on um, 
as we engage with stakeholders. And this has very much dominated our thinking about uh, a very sort of large scale roadmap that I'll, I'll, I'll mention. And a very important component of this that, that has gotten lost in a lot of the, the writing is that HGP write we will do in cells only, uh, not uh, producing an organism. <coughs> so the roadmap here is in the first five years to have a very heavy focus on technology development, but also to develop pilot projects that would have, uh, we hope, uh, immediate benefits uh, for society. And you'll hear about uh, more of that in a moment. Uh, and during this time period, to have intense debate about the HGP right component and engage uh, as diverse uh, a group of stakeholders as possible. And as a designer, uh, I'm very interested in identifying what is the worthy design or what are the worthy designs for HGP right. I don't think we really know yet. Or maybe there's an equally or more worthy goal. And after that, then we could pursue these highly worthy big genome projects while continuing to develop the technology, because we're probably not going to get that thousand-fold drop in price just in five years. So GP right and HDP right, uh, people often ask, why did we change the name? Well, we listened to a lot of you uh, a year ago. And we thought that uh, uh, de defining these two components in this way uh, was really helpful to the future of the project. Now, a lot of the journalists I've talked to come back to me with one question over and over again when we talk about HGP right in particular, uh, but also GP right. And that is, why are you doing this? And I will offer two kinds of answers. One is, I want to know the rules that make a genome tick. I want to learn about it. And this is paraphrased in a quote that was allegedly found on the blackboard of Richard Feynman after he died. What I cannot create, I cannot understand. And this has become kind of a, uh, a manifesto for, uh, for our field. Uh, and an example of something uh, that we, we learned by doing this is the three-dimensional structure of synthetic chromosomes in the nucleus of the yeast cell. Um, so on the right here, you see maps of chromosomes taking trajectories through the nucleus of a cell. This is, this is done using a technique called Hi c And this is one such chromosome synthesized in Tianjin University, the fifth chromosome. You'll hear more about that later. This is the native version. And this is what happens when we make a synthetic version, which has a whole bunch of thousands of changes to the DNA sequence. Uh, we've removed all the repetitive DNA. We've removed all the tRNA genes. And yet, there's a, only a minimal impact on the trajectory of the G DNA through the genome and the overall structure. And secondly, um, we want to do good things, not bad things. Um, why? Well, I thought I'd go biblical on you, OK? <laughs> There's the 10 plagues, right, from Exodus. Here they are, water to blood, frogs, lice, etc. And so guess what? Today, we have environmental destruction. We have invasive species. We have emerging pathogens, <coughs> problems with food security, and climate change. And all of these things have a you know, potential biological solutions uh, that GP right we think could be an integral part of. Um, I'm getting a signal that I need to stop, but I can't resist telling you a little bit about writing. <laughs> okay, here's the history of writing. And you can see it goes way back. And, you know, George will tell you that he's already, like, encoded uh, an entire movie in DNA, you know, every, every pixel. But actually, on this here, when we talk about DNA writing in cells, we're kind of, we're kind of in this Gutenberg phase. We, we can write millions of letters of DNA, but that's about it. Uh, so we have a long ways to go. We're actually just at the very beginning of this project. 
In fact, the history of DNA writing in cells started around 1976, the year I graduated from college, with Corona's synthesis of the um, uh, transfer RNA gene. And uh, it's extended recently. Uh, you can see here a uh, virus in 2002, uh, Venter Institute's mycoplasma in 2010, and this year, 2017, a third of the way through yeast, and maybe human uh, 2027. And note that this is enlarged 100-fold, this one 1,000-fold, and this one uh, almost 500,000-fold. So I'll wrap up by telling you our recent activity in the past year. Our SC 2.0 project, which you're going to hear a lot about, has generated a lot of global excitement for the project. We have uh, uh, participants here from Australia, China, uh, new participants from Japan, um, and new funding of various types that uh, George will go into in more depth. But I especially want to emphasize this international nature of this project, and, and this whole project has essentially been invited to become part of GP Right. That's one important decision that we made over the past year. And finally, um, we're launching something we call the Dark Matter Project with a number of people you'll hear from uh, later on today. And uh, in case you don't know what that is, you can turns out you can just look it up on Amazon. So if you forget, uh, you, can, you can learn more about it there. And with that, I'm going to ask George to come up, and we'll take questions uh, at the end of his presentation. So uh, my conflict of interest slide, uh, I'm going to be talking about one pilot project that Jeff has already mentioned. Uh, first, the funding. This, I think that we have to put this in the context of past funding and recent academic and commercial. Um, not all of them focused on the same goals, not all of them brought about by this initiative, but I think any of you who feel like you have funding that is related to this and would like to join the club, feel free to let me know. Or if I have accidentally included you and you don't want to be included, please let me know. I just, this will be publicly available information. Uh, you all know about this super exponential curve. So this is factors of 10 on the y-axis. So when it goes hockey stick up, that's a double hockey stick. And this is for both reading and writing uh, genomes. And I think it's important to do both interconnected with each other, reading, writing, and testing, most importantly. Um, we've got three million-fold improvement in s sequencing and a billion-fold improvement in synthesis of oligonucleotides on chips now. Um, but we want to turn that into testing in cells and in organoids. Um, this particular um, example here, this uh, is, uh, I just can't uh, stand the uh, typos there. Um, um, this particular uh, pilot project is on so-called ultra-safe cells for manufacturing and therapies. Uh, these could be any mammalian cell, since those are used for making protein pharmaceuticals and vaccines. Probably it will be human so that we can also use them for stem cell therapies and transplants. But we want them to be virus resistant, prion resistant, radiation resistant, senescence resistant. Uh, we're just getting warmed up. Um, endogenous retroviruses, Lu Han Yang, we'll talk about that uh, later in this meeting. Um, and the virus resistance, I should mention, Nili Ostrov will be giving a presentation on, on that. Um, so I won't go over those. Uh, triplet repeats. Um, we want them to be uh, germline negative but pluripotent. Um, we want to have fail-proof self-destruction, which we've already um, demonstrated using non-standard amino acids in E. coli. We want to transfer this over to mammalian cells. Cancer-resistant, immune-negative, genome swap regimes, and so on. We are. Uh, engineering mammalian, oh, but I forgot to mention in that, that second column are some of the people that, that are taking this on as postdocs and graduate students, the same thing for mammalian repeats, the simple sequence receipts, telomeres, centromeres, ribosomal um, DNA signs like alus, lines, and endogenous retroviruses. We've already knocked out um, 62 endogenous retroviruses, in fact, we've done it more than one different pig uh, strain, and so that emboldened us to take on all these other categories of repeats, some of which we haven't even sequenced yet. It's, it's a, um, a dirty little secret that there has never been a 
human genome or for that matter a mammalian or vertebrate genome that's been sequenced anywhere in the world to my knowledge. Um, you heard it here if you didn't hear it before. Um, I will not declare victory until we have many human genomes uh, sequenced all the way through, telomere to telomere, and engineered as well. So um, Nilly will tell you more about engineering um, a 4 million base pair uh, genome uh, for four goals, non-standard amino acids, genetic and metabolic isolation, this biocontainment that's one of the goals of safe genomes, and multivirus resistance. I think it's very profound that we can be resistant to all viruses. These cells can be resistant to all viruses without uh, even some we've never seen before. We want to be able to use these cells in two directions, in one direction, or in many directions, but one of them is developing gene therapies where we take a deleterious allele and turn it into a normal one. And the other is going from a normal allele to deleterious so we can de determine cause and effect for the millions of, of new, unknown, um, possibly disease-causing uh, alleles that we're finding as we're starting to sequence um, uh, everybody on the planet. Hopefully all of you have been sequenced, I'm, I'm sure. You have. Um, and then um, for this, we need properly consented cells, and we turn to the Personal Genome Project for those, we, and Jason Bobe uh, will talk about that. Um, we have genome and epigenome engineering. I've already mentioned uh, some of our genome engineering uh, tools, and we'll mention it again in the like, speed thing uh, late this afternoon. Um, but I just want to take a moment about epigenome engineering. In order to do the read, write, and test, the testing needs to have almost any kind of cell or organ in the human body without actually making a human being. And, and also sequencing is really important. It's hard to edit or write a genome if you've never read one or if you haven't read one that's relevant. And once you've made it, you want to sequence it. And so we constantly sequence the genomes that we're engineering. It's, we take it for granted that it's trivial to sequence a human genome. It's just uh, something that you check a box and it happens. So this have this variance of unknown significance pipeline. And if this full, finally, there is a full transcription factor library for all the human transcription factor genes and, and including uh, multiple uh, alternative splice forms so you can actually determine the causality there. And we've used it for making almost any cell type we set our mind to. Uh, I don't know of a, of a failure since we've finished uh, getting this full library. This library will be distributed through AdGene, as many of our other Genome Project Write tools have been distributed through AdGene, which is a nearly, you know, as a nonprofit, great way to distribute things. Here are some of the cell types that we've developed, um, new ways of getting neurons, muscular <coughs> musculature, uh, endothelial blood vessels. Um, uh, ligodendrocytes for glia uh, and glia, so forth. Um, here's how you can use it for various unknown significance. Um, here we take one of the personal genome project cell lines, which is um, uh, freely available, and uh, it's a stem cell line. It can be engineered with any of the genome project right tools to uh, make one base pair change, you then sequence the genome to make sure you change that base pair and nothing else. This is in a clonal cell line, so the issues about off-target and on-target problems c disappear when you, when you sequence clonal cell lines. Um, and then you can, you can epigenetically reprogram these from fibroblasts to stem cells where you do the genetic engineering to cardiac tissue. Here you get this beautiful cardiac repeat. Uh, structure here, and you can, with a single base change, you can alter the lipid biochemistry, the mitochondrial function, the morphology, and the and the um, contractile nature, and so showing that of a, in an in of one one patient, not necessarily some gigantic correlation, you've got something that's more co possibly more convincing, which is cause and effect, and you can complement that with a messenger RNA. You can extend this to um, a broader set of genes involved in aging reversal. This might be something that would be appropriately genome-wide. Um, we want to have pathogen resistance, uh, senescence resistance, and cancer resistance. And there's a uh, da database that uh, one of my previous postdocs, Pedro de Magalas, has maintained ever since then that includes 305 human uh, aging-related genes, and we're tackling these both in a gene therapy form but also in a cell and tissue level. And so I just want to uh, <clears throat> wrap up with this slide. I'll come up, oops, that's got a typo in it. Um, 
and the, the thank you uh, to some of the people, and this is just a small set of the people that I've mentioned along the way in the slides, that are working on the genomically engineered organs, which I consider a significant part of this genome project, right? So I'll just leave it, uh, uh, we'll have Q&A for all of us now, um, all three of us. Questions? Seriously, how many people do have their genome sequenced since we're in Genome Sequencing Center? How many do not? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, you're in the right place. <laughs> yes, question. With the genome synthesis project, one would like to understand how proteins interact, how proteins fold, how they interact with DNA, and many, many other uh, types of features. Now, this to me seems to be lacking right now. So, um, to be successful with all these engineering projects, one needs to tackle uh, the structural issues. So, are there any plans of the human genome? genome synthesis project, um, what they are, or if not, why not? I'll tackle that. Uh, so first of all, to, to engineer systems to do amazing things for society, you do not have to have full understanding. And my favorite example is smallpox. We did not understand viruses or immunology when we started wiping out smallpox uh, worldwide in the 1700s. Uh, we still probably don't understand them very well. Um, that said, we can um, engineer 3D structure. We're, we're doing, Jeff showed example of understanding 3D structure of the nucleus, um, which is a new 3D structure. Um, the cryo is getting better. Uh, we have crystallography of things as large as, as ribosomes. And my lab, as part of our GP right uh, efforts, are engineering proteins um, both from scratch, de novo protein uh, design, as well as engineering proteins that are in uh, currently existing in systems, and we use that to make the first really biocontained uh, organism that's at probably at 10 to the minus 16th containment level um, by engineering essential genes that are dependent upon non-standard amino acids designed in the computer by, by uh, Rosetta um, protein design tools. So we're very excited about exactly the problems that you're talking about. But we could, you know, like many things, this is a, this is a project about meeting challenges, not about evading them. In order for this project to be successful, which new technologies or existing technologies need to be improved or created in order to give us the, the, the tools, the kit, to be able to do this on the huge scale that's required? Well, uh, obviously, the, the first order of business is uh, reduction in costs of DNA synthesis. Uh, so as George mentioned, uh, we, we can make millions of oligonucleotides on chips, but producing them in a practical format that can be used to actually write DNA at low cost, larger DNAs, is still a work in progress. So that's, that's one area. You know, we're in the 10 cents per base pair range right now in terms of practical costs for synthesizing DNA. So that's, that's at the top of the list for me, is to reduce that a thousandfold. Second one is assembling those DNAs into ever larger structures, an area that we're particularly interested in. So how can we make 100,000 MERS or million MERS uh, much more efficiently, much more quickly, and much more accurately? And, um, and then delivering those really large DNAs to cells is still a real bottleneck, uh, particularly in mammalian systems. And so those would be three uh, very high on the list uh, on, the, on the DNA end. And then, as George mentioned, the readouts that we need, the testing uh, of the phenotypes of cells, very deep testing, uh, deep phenotypic testing, is something else that we'd really like to see the cost drop on. How does this activity ties, if any, into this new 
activity of cellless biology. Cellless biology, if any. Y you're talking about I I uh, cell-free systems? Correct. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, I, we, it's probably not well integrated at the moment, but we're open to suggestions. Yeah, we do call it uh, in cells, so I guess it's sort of fundamentally uh, not the same thing. But if there's some way we can do rapid prototyping, we'll, we'll take it. So we're, we're very open-minded. So I think we should move on to the next uh, stage. Yep.